2 Kings chapter 2. I call this message Answering God's Call. Starting well and finishing well. Answering God's Call. Today with caller ID, it's a lot easier to decide which calls to answer now. Because when I grew up back in the day, we had one of those in our house. Actually, it was an apartment. But we had a, a one phone on the kitchen wall with like the 100-foot cord on it. You could take it all around the house and try to get some privacy, like off by yourself somewhere. And we just had one phone there. And of course, it had no voicemail, no answering machines back in that day. And so when the phone rang, you had to answer every single one of them. Today, of course, you can ignore the ones that you don't want. If it's a sales call or if I'm calling you, <laughs> you can just ignore that. Please don't ignore me. Yeah, we don't have to pick them up. Well, God wants you to answer his call whenever he calls. Now, first and foremost, like we talked about during communion, I pray that you would answer the most important call, and that's that you would put your faith in him and be born again. All right, that's the, the most important call to answer. And then, you know, just like our worship team sang that song, Build My Life, that you would commit to your life by starting your life well with him now and ending it well, that you would build your life upon him and his grace and, and those foundational things that he teaches us in the word. And that's what this chapter is about. It teaches us how to answer God's call successfully. It's for somebody who's starting out, like we're going to see this man, this prophet named Elisha, or it's somebody who's been a Christian a long time and maybe they're getting to the end of their days, like Elijah is here in our text, but anywhere in, in between. And so uh, as we go through this chapter, what I'm going to do is just point out seven applications that I drew out of this, and maybe you'd find different ones, but this is just kind of help us to remember and apply these things because they're applicable to Christians today. Those lessons on answering God's call. Okay. So that's what we're going to do together. And let's begin here in what the word says in Second Kings chapter 2, and I'll start reading in verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Okay, so these two guys are prophets, spokesmen for God to Israel. They are, are given prophetic words from God and the ability to perform miracles. And it isn't just so that there, it looks cool. It's to accomplish God's will. Like he cares about people and he sees Israel going the wrong way and he sends these prophets to try and get them to turn to the Lord. And Elijah is the one who's been teaching Elisha. He's kind of like the junior guy. Back in 1 Kings, God told Elijah to anoint Elisha for the ministry. And so that's what he's been doing because you guys know it's God is the one who calls somebody into the ministry. But then, you know what he does? He gives the leaders the responsibility to train him up. And Elisha knows that. And so he's put himself under the authority of Elijah to train him. And according to some scholars, they say that this has been going on at this point for like six to eight years. So pretty intensive <laughs> program there. Elijah's been helping him in his development. Just like today, God has the more mature people, believers, disciple the newer ones, the, the, the up-and-comers. <laughs> As I said before, Elijah's ministry is coming to an end. That's why it says there in verse 1, that he's going to be taken up into a whirlwind. He's going to heaven. It's his last day on earth. And he knows it. What would that be like? How would you handle that if you knew it was your last day? That would be a strange day, wouldn't it? There'd be some kind of excitement. I hope you'd be excited. <laughs> but like well, maybe pensive. And So the Lord's taking him to a certain place to take him up in some kind of a whirlwind into heaven. Well, let's continue on and see what happens. Verse 2 says, Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down 
to Bethel. He won't go back. <laughs> Wants to be around Elijah as much as possible. Good for him. Okay, so I said I was going to give you some applications here, and we've come to the first one. We're talking about answering God's call to, to start and, and end well. The first one is be committed. Be committed. I believe what's happening here is Elijah is testing Elisha's commitment to his calling from God. And it appears that everyone is tested this way. You know, we come into God's family, and then he begins to test the genuineness of it, our commitment to it. I mean, <laughs> Jesus was tested. The disciples were tested. And so are you. It could look like a lot of things. It could be something like you might be tested just to see if you're going to be faithful with the responsibilities you have with your family. It could be if you're going to be faithful when it comes to the ministry that God has given to you. Or those of you who are a business owner, if you're going to be honest with that. Or, you know, in the workplace, all kinds of different things. Am I going to answer the call of God in just my normal, everyday life? <laughs> He's being urged here to be committed. And then it says in verse 3 that the sons of the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master? He's talking about Elijah. Take away your master from over you today. And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. So a little background. Elijah has a, not only is he discipling Elisha one on one. But he also has a training school for young prophets, right? It's sort of like a Bible college or seminary where young people, in this case, young men, were being discipled. And so they would do things like they do in Bible college and seminary today. They would study God's word and they'd learn to hear from God. And they did this so that they would know how they should speak for God. That's what they're doing here. And all of them live together what looks like in several different schools around Israel. And so these students hear what's going on, and they say to Elisha, do you know what's going to happen today? <laughs> Elisha's like, yeah, I'm aware, I'm a prophet, hello. <laughs> you know? Well, then it says in verse 4, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. This is the second time it's happened, right? He says essentially the same thing that he did um, the first time. Now, you know, just practically speaking, on the one hand, it could be that Elijah might be trying to protect Elisha a little bit. Because he knows he's going to be taken up into a whirlwind. He's not sure what it's going to be like. And so just to be safe, why don't you stay over there? <laughs> kind of a thing. That, that could be part of this, maybe. But again, I come back to what I said before, and it's more likely that he's just testing Elisha's commitment level. You might be wondering why commitment is so important. Think about what he's going to have to do. Elisha is going to have to be determined because of the culture that he lives in. I mean, Israel is a mess. They, where he's preaching, where he's living, all the kings of the northern tribes are evil. And they're, it's going throughout uh, the nation there. The immorality of the people of the day is super high. And he can't be this guy who gives up easily. And so the commitment level has got to be high. And you and I, my friend, we can't be Christians that give up easily. And so what the Lord does is he tests our commitment level, try and raise it all the time. There's a kind of commitment to the ministry that God requires, that there's a lot of things that you could say, but there's two that I was thinking about that you and I should be aware of when it comes to commitment. Number one, God requires that it be voluntary, right? We're a volunteer army here. Nobody is making you serve the Lord. Nobody is. He wants you to do this out of response to his great love and grace towards you, his mercy and how good he is. We sang those songs this morning. He's good. 
And so that's, we're supposed to respond to serve to him for that. It should be voluntary in whatever we do. And then the second thing that God requires in this commitment is that we just be faithful in it. But I'll tell you, just in my own discovery, and maybe you've experienced this too, that those things, they require determination <laughs> because it's not always easy to be in the ministry. And we're all in full-time ministry here. F.B. Meyer, he said, the law of the Christian life is always advance. (laughs) And I love that. It fits in here because it's like, I need this desire to always go forward and leave more behind in order to follow Jesus. That I would want to know the Lord more. That I would want to grow in grace more. That you and I would have a deeper level of commitment. That's what the Lord wants from you and I as a response to him. So that great commitment. And Elisha is passing the tests here so far. Well, verse five, he says, now the sons of the prophets, here they come again, who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. (laughs) This is so funny to me for some reason. These are a different group of students. They're at Jericho. Remember I said there was a few schools and this is a different one, but they say the same thing, don't they? And it sounds like Elisha is getting kind of frustrated with the newbies. He's like, stop prophesying. (laughs) I know. So they're just like, you know, today's the day. What are you, you ready? And, you know, that kind of a thing. But he he wants them to quit reminding him. Well, then it says in verse 6, Elijah said to him, stay here, please. For the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So uh, did you see that Elisha refuses to leave for the third time? No. So do you think he passed the commitment test? He did, right? Elijah was trying to see, see are you going to do this? And, and he did. Okay, so let's just picture this with me, if you would, but just kind of with your mind's eye. So they're out there in the desert. Picture a desert with the Jordan River going through it. And Elijah is trying to get some privacy because the Lord is going to take him to heaven any minute. And there's 50 Bible college students standing there watching the whole thing. Like, you know what he's going to do next? You know, they're probably all talking and stuff. (laughs) And Elijah decides he's, he's going to split the Jordan River. And so he's got this called a mantle here. It's like a an outer garment, sort of like a robe, maybe like a heavy one. And so he, and you know, it's connected to his ministry as being a prophet. And so what he does, he takes it and he rolls it up and he whacks the river with it and it's split so they can walk through. Isn't that amazing? This isn't the first time that this has happened. This is the same place, almost, maybe almost the exact same place where the Jordan River parted because God is doing the parting. It's not the mantle doing it or Elijah doing it. It's God doing it. And this is the same part, that same place that parted when the children of Israel crossed over into the promised land in the book of Joshua. So it's just a a miracle. We can't explain it. It's hard for us to relate to that. Uh, Somebody once said that if you can believe the first verse in the Bible, then you can believe all these other things. I'd say that's pretty, probably pretty true. So Elijah performs his last miracle before he goes to heaven. And so it was, he says in verse 9, when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, It shall be so for you, but if not, it shall 
not be so. So Elijah just says, is there any last thing I can do for you? He's a servant right to the end. Love this guy. And he just wants to serve him. And Elisha could have asked for anything at this point. But what does he ask for? He asks for more of God's spirit. So that's our second application. You were wondering how long it was going to take me to get to the next one. I remember I was teaching when our church was really small and on the back wall it had this clock. You know, I usually teach for like 40, 45 minutes and I was like two thirds of the way into it and I was still on point one. And I remember like a lady sitting there when I said, okay, now point two, she turned around and looked at the clock. <laughs> so I I'm going to finish on time. Don't just chill. Okay. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. You guys okay? Okay, good. So number two is desire more of the spirit. Desire more of the Spirit. You know, he knows that God's power is upon Elijah. That he can't do anything without that. And so he says, I want double. (laughs) Give me a double-double. And we need that. We need a lot of God's Spirit upon it. In order to keep our commitment to God, we need a regular filling of God's Spirit. We need uh, his power upon our life. And to me, that should be a desire of all Christians. It's something that we keep coming back to in the scriptures. Because you, my friend, need the power of the Spirit. Because we live in a fallen world and we have a a fallen nature. (laughs) It's just not easy here. And we encounter all kinds of difficulty. And we need his strength. We need his power. And so Elisha is wise. That's how he's going to finish well in his life because he wants God's spirit. But uh, did you see how Elijah answered? He's like, I don't know, bro. That's a big ask. (laughs) I guess my God might do that for you. I don't, I'm not sure. So he says, if you see me go, you'll get it. If you don't, sorry, Charlie, you don't get it. Verse 11 says, then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. All right, there he goes. Bye, Elijah. He's just a great man of God. If you get a chance, read through kind of the second half of First Kings because it talks a lot about him. He starts, I think, in verse chapter 17 and then through the end of that book. God worked powerfully through that guy's life and he was committed to him until the very end and so just seeing someone who answered the call on his life and it's such an example for me and i hope it is for you too but now his time is over and so god takes him home in a whirlwind there's some sort of chariot of fire with horses and isn't it great that's how i want to (laughs) go anybody with me anybody want to go like that a few of you, some of you are like, no. <laughs> you know. Have you ever heard that joke that all Christians want to go to heaven? They just don't want to go today. <laughs> you know, like some of us are like, well, I want to like see my kids graduate. <laughs> so Elijah is there one moment and then he's gone. We see him come back later on in the Bible, in the Gospels, when he returns with Moses to talk with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember that when that happened, if you know your Bibles a little bit? And it's really an interesting situation that's there with the disciples and everything. Some people say that Moses and Elijah are there because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And it could be that's why they were there talking to Jesus, uh, who's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, right? And then I was reading this week about this and somebody said that it could be that Moses represents the saints who die and will be raised up because that's what happened to Moses, right? And Elijah represents those who are caught up alive to heaven to meet the Lord in the rapture of the church. And it could be those things, right? Because he doesn't die. He didn't just die. He was taken up to heaven a lot. And we just covered this in First Thessalonians, that one day a generation of Christians is going to be taken up a lot like this, where we'll just go to meet the Lord 
in the air. And what a great day that will be. It could be us. It could be our generation. We don't know. We're supposed to be uh, comforting one another in those words. And so Elijah's ministry is over now. He finished well because he answered the call of God on his life. Well, now it says in verse 12, and Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces, it says. Okay, so he sees the whole thing and he rips his clothes. Why would he do that? Well, it's his good friend. (laughs) Those of us who are left are usually upset when somebody goes on, even when even when we know it's better for them, right? It's still tough. He's mourning the loss of a friend. At least that's probably part of it. You know, we don't know all of it. But when I'm reading this, you know, my takeaway here is it's a good thing that Elisha didn't go back, isn't it? Look at all of what he would have missed. He wouldn't have seen any of that if he went back. So here's our third application about answering God's call. And that's to be part of what God is doing. Be part of what God is doing. I don't have to say this to some of you because you want to be part of whatever God will let you do. You know, you're the one who, when you fill out the little card that says, you know, which ministry you want to be involved in, you check all the boxes. (laughs) There's some people that are like that. You're like, well, they want to do whatever they could kind of a, a thing. And I don't blame you because... I don't want to miss what God wants to do in my life. And I don't want to skip out uh, uh, on stuff, on what he wants us to be part of. As an example of this, I've had so many people tell me that they are thankful that they got involved in our house-to-house groups, you know, our small groups, our home groups. Because some folks come here and they hear the emphasis that we place on community, especially when it comes to Christians gathering together in small groups. And they're a little reluctant, you know, for one reason or another. I've heard testimony from person after person after person that said, this is the best thing I've done. I never had Christian friends. I never, we just have such a sweet little community and and we get to do things together. And it's such a blessing. And, you know, thank you for having this. And they're like Elisha. If they never went, they wouldn't get that blessing. Same thing with serving or giving, you know. People, when they begin to just like say, I'm going to do what the Lord calls me to do and answer that, well, who knows what he might do. And so it's a blessing to be part of what's doing. Then we won't miss what he wants to do in our life. (laughs) My niece calls this FOMO, uh, fear of missing out. (laughs) She has a fear of missing out. And so, you know, it's like Elisha, you're not going anywhere without me. (laughs) Because <laughs> he has a fear of missing out. And, and for good reason. He knew great things would happen. And for you, just know that anytime God is working, <laughs> great things happen. So I'm your pastor, and I love you guys. And I just want to encourage you to find where God is working and be part of it. Okay? Well, verse 13 and 14 says, He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Okay, he just uh, repeats or imitates what he saw Elijah do. See, he's learned. He's learned. It divides again. Now, let me ask you this. Is the power to divide that river in the robe, the mantle. Is the power in Elijah or or any of those prophets? Is it in them? No, where's the power? Power's from God, right? And so what we're seeing here, we're witnessing this power just simply being passed on to the next guy. Application number four in our series of seven here. Number four is accept that the ministry continues on. By the way, Elisha performs twice the number of miracles that Elijah did. Remember he asked for a double portion of the spirit? Well, if you count up what Elijah did and then count up what Elisha does, it's twice the number. And so think about that for a minute. 
often what we see in the ministry is the next person does more with it than the previous person. It's just how I've, I've witnessed it time and time again over the years. Now, that doesn't mean that that second person is better than the first one was or that God loves that second person more, but just that the ministry continues on and God grows it, refines it, makes it better. Back in 1 Kings, Elijah at one point thought he was indispensable to God. But is he indispensable? No. His ministry goes on. And it's actually going to be more effective than before. I mean, Elijah gets all the press, but Elisha's ministry is more effective. And he does more with it than uh, uh, Elijah did. So I like to remember, and I'm going to share this with you, we are never irreplaceable. God, It's God's ministry. And he wants to use us But he often improves over what we used to do. And I believe that we should be preparing others to take it to the next place. I mean, I've had this discussion with many of the people in ministry with me that we ought to be training up the next people who are going to take over one day. And I shouldn't, when they are raised up and they begin to do it better than me, I shouldn't be mad. I should be glad that God is doing a great thing. And just like Elijah did with Elisha. Elijah Elijah wasn't mad. He was glad that Elisha was going to take this and do something great um, with it. It's because that's a kingdom mindset, isn't it? It's a way to end well. Kingdom. Verse 15 says, then, now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And then they said to him, look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them. Therefore, they, uh, they sent 50 men and they searched for three days, but could not Fine. You see what's happening here? They think that God picked Elijah up and like dropped him somewhere like the Wizard of Oz tornado kind of a thing. Like over there and we're going to go find him. It looks like they're having a little trouble accepting the fact that Elijah is really gone and we're stuck with this guy now. (laughs) Maybe there's some of that. Our natural way of thinking is sometimes opposed to, to faith like that guy who came up to Jesus one time and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. (laughs) You know, that part, the unbelief part (laughs) is what the Lord is after all the time. They're struggling with that. And they're like, come on, let us go look. And he's like, okay, go. Verse 18, it says, and when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? (laughs) Hello, I'm a prophet. (laughs) See, this is why these guys are still in school. You know, they've still got a lot to learn about God. Okay, we come to application number five of the seven. Number five. I was going to call this one, Don't Be Annoying. But I'm going to actually call it, Skeptics Should See for Themselves. Skeptics Should See for Themselves. You know, it's okay if you need to look into something to get behind it. It's okay. It's actually kind of a good thing in, in some places. You know, the Bible says to test all things. So I shouldn't just go blindly into things. I should, it's okay to be a little skeptical. There's a place, if it helps you to answer God's call to do a little homework, then do a little homework. I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago, we had a new to the fellowship lunch. And some of you guys uh, were here for that. Because it's important to me in the church sense that it, church isn't weird. And so what helps to me is to be transparent. And so I try to like open it up for questions for people to ask whatever they want. And so uh, that group a couple weeks ago when we did the lunch, they asked me tons of questions. It was great. Things about our doctrinal beliefs and how we handle the money and, you know, and all those kind of things. And I was glad to answer them. Now, I don't know how well I did because I don't know how many people came back after that, but just want people to we want them to be part of what we're doing and so we should be open 
about that and, and answers questions. So it's like skeptics seeing for themselves. You go to a new church, you don't know what this is about. And so it's, it's healthy to a- ask those questions and other things. Maybe you want to support a ministry, a, a missionary someplace. You want to look into that a little bit too before you do it. So if it helps you to answer God's call, I think it's good. Well, it says in verse 19, then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. Okay, so the scene shifts now and you'll see throughout Elisha's ministry that he does like real life ministry stuff. Not that Elijah didn't, but it's more so with Elisha. He's more of an approachable guy. Elijah was more of a loner. Elijah was a little harsher. Elisha's like kind of a grace, nicer guy sort of a thing. He likes to help the community. And that's what he's just doing here. They have a contaminated water supply. And so they're asking him to help them. And even though the miracles that he does are for a greater purpose, right? He's trying to turn Israel's heart away from idols and back to God. But along the way, he has compassion on people, just like Jesus has compassion on people. And so he wants to help that town. And that's what he does next in verse 20. It says, and he said, bring me a bowl and put salt in it. Why Why salt? We don't know. So they brought it to him and, and he went out to the source of the water and cast the salt in there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it, there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Okay. So again, he just wanted to do a good thing for those people in that town. So application number six, and again, it's for answering the call purposes is do good to all people. Do good to all people. You know, we can probably agree pretty quickly that we should do good to the believers. <laughs> but God wants us to do good for all people. He's got you here in Meridian or wherever you live in the Treasure Valley, in that neighborhood where you live and at your workplace and your family. There's great opportunities for good. And God wants to do good And he does it through you and through me, helping. You know, like they're healing this water. It's such a picture of bringing life into a place, a business or a a school. You know, you might be a teacher in a school or employee for some construction company or whatever it is. You bring healing life into it just because you have the Holy Spirit in you. What an opportunity to do good to all people. In verse 23, he said, then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, this is great. Some youths came up from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. (laughs) Oh boy. Kids these days. Apparently, it's kids from all days. (laughs) Not just these days. What do we got here? We got some teens that are teasing Elisha because... He's balding, right? You know what's funny about this? I mean, there's a a lot of funny, but one of the funny things is that Elisha lives about 60 more years after this. So he's still pretty young. So apparently it's like premature balding. Today, this isn't a big deal because guys shave their heads now because it's like a cool thing to do. But back then it really wasn't. And so they're making fun of him because of his hair. Uh, lack of hair. But that's not the real reason that they're making fun of him. That's just a little tag on there. To me, the real reason is they're mocking Elijah being taken to heaven. Because everybody would know, like that kind of news travels fast. (laughs) And everybody would have known what happened to uh, Elijah. And so his teenagers are essentially saying, why don't you get out of here like baldy? You see what they're doing? And there's a reason for this, because the sinners hated that God would use the prophets to hold them accountable for their actions. And that's what the prophets did. And so, you know, it's like Jesus testified that that's why they put all the prophets to death in Israel. They hated the prophets. They treated them awfully. And they're saying, 
Elijah went out of here. Why don't you go out of here too? Just making fun of him. Well, what happens, do you think? Verse 24. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Whoa. Uh, John Corson said, if you're not careful around Elisha, you might find yourself in an unbearable situation. <laughs> that a, that's a groaner, isn't it? It's a great groaner. But <laughs> the law in Israel was you weren't supposed to disrespect your elders, nor were you supposed to disrespect prophets. Because if you mocked them, you know who you were mocking? God. And so it says, and you can, I don't don't have the verses for you, but you can track it down in the law, um, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, that if you did those things, a curse would be pronounced upon you. Application number seven, last one, we'll do together. Number seven is beware of scoffing at the Lord. (laughs) Does this even need to be said? So I'm going to say it. Okay, so because you could get mauled by a bear. It doesn't say the bears killed them, but I was talking to one of the guys out in front. That would be a pretty good beating, right? To get mauled by a bear. It wouldn't take much, but it doesn't say they killed him, but it probably was pretty bad. Now, did uh, who chose what kind of curse it would be? Was it Elisha who chose that curse? No. God chose what? So the Lord did this. It was because of what they did to him and, and what it meant to God's ministry there in, in Israel. Because again, insulting God's people is an insult to God himself. He won't tolerate it. Now this doesn't give me a right to yell at the neighborhood kids to get off my lawn, does it? You know, spraying with the hose, curse you. Curse you. But it does show, and all kidding aside, God is serious. <laughs> He's loving, he's kind, he's gracious, but he's also serious. And I know this is the Old Testament, so I want to be careful with that. But God isn't messing around here. And so if somebody is determined to really mess with God's people, he will do something. We see it in the New Testament. He does it. So beware, scoffing at the Lord. It says, then he went up from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Like we talked about last week, his primary ministry is in northern Israel. He has a house in Samaria, like the capital that they had, and so that will be his base of operations. And he's going to preach and help and try to turn that nation back to God, try and get him to do that. So read ahead. So just as a quick review, what did we learn today? Hopefully you learned something. (laughs) We saw that God desires a greater commitment from us uh, all the time. I think every day, (laughs) maybe even in moment by moment, a greater commitment. He also, we should want more of the spirit in our life because you're going to need that to accomplish his will. In your life, we saw that it's important to be part of what God's doing. Find a place where God is working and be part of that. We should accept that the ministry continues on without us. <laughs> Shouldn't hold on to it so tight that nobody else is allowed to do this. That skeptics, it's okay for those of us who are a little skeptical to check up on things before we throw ourselves into it. We saw that we're supposed to do good to all, right? And then the last one there was watch out for scoffing. God. You know, all these things sort of add into that theme of answering God's call upon our life. So remember, Elijah finished well because he answered God's call upon his life. And Elisha is starting off well in those things. And we're going to see that his life ends well because of it too. So I like to finish up my messages just to send you on your way with a question for the car ride home. <laughs> so it's just something that you discuss as your family or if you're by yourself in the car that you'd think through this. And it's just a simple one. And here it is. Do you think that you will end well? And why or why not is that? So I'll leave you with that. God bless you guys.